So emptiness, when we come to that place, as Daniel Neymar did, we realize is actually fullness. Less is actually more. How could it be, you might ask? Well, let's see. I've been reading a little Dr. Seuss with Grace lately, so. <laughs> there will be rhyming couplets occasionally. <laughs> So in the meditation, we had an image of a, a bowl of light, and actually that comes from a Hawaiian story about children. And the story, the Hawaiian story, is that when children come into the world, they are like a bowl of light. Another way of understanding who we are in truth, right? And so the children are in truth that, that oneness, right? And we know that too, right? We see, we see that. We experience that with infants, that sense of, of I'm still one. You know, there's a, I don't remember what the date or the time is in our development when we start to differentiate with our mothers, but there's a long period of time where we, we're just one. We're just in the oneness, right? We don't even know that there's a me until one day we suddenly look at a hand or a foot and go, oh, wait, is that, what? look, we're separate, you know? So, so it's that beginning of two-ness. It's the beginning of, of understanding ourselves as two. So in this, this bowl of light that the Hawaiian children are taught um, that they are, there is the story that if a child then, as they grow, become envious or jealous, a stone gets put into that bowl of light. And so every time there are those kinds of experiences, more stones get put into the bowl of light. Well, eventually, of course, as you might imagine, the light can't get through anymore, right? And in the story, the children are told that eventually, if you let that bowl fill with stones, there will be no light. In fact, you will become like a stone. You won't be able to grow. You won't be able to move. But the magic to you as the stone is that if you realize that you don't want to be this and you want to be filled with light again, all you got to do is empty the bowl. And there you are again, returned to your original state. So when we come in in this oneness as this bowl of receptive light and radiating light, then, you know, it's, it's the, as I said, the differentiation begins at some point, and we begin to be introduced to the material world, the world of form, the world of me and not me, and boundaries of this that we think is a boundary, right? But we learn on the spiritual path, not so much. But we're little, we're learning to be, you know, we're learning to develop an ego, which we need a healthy ego to be a healthy human divine being on the, on the earth. And so we're, we're learning the world of contrast. Suddenly we get introduced to things like hot and cold, or dark and light, or male and female, all these differences, these contrasts that we get introduced to. And so as we get introduced to those things, and our human teachers, our adult teachers, teach us the best they can, right? Everybody does the best they can with what they have. But of course, in that process, we get taught some things that aren't so true about us that are, don't have anything to do with that bowl of light and that oneness that we are comprised of. And so what Charles Fillmore, our co-founder, would call error thoughts get introduced. We begin to think of ourselves differently as less than or better than. We begin to think of ourselves as maybe not enough, or we have, like the, in the Hawaiian story, jealous or envious thoughts, resentments or complaints, discomforts that become complaints. And so those stones then start to fill up, right? <laughs> and so our work then is to let it go, is to begin to open it up, begin to release. So to let go and to return to the land of the soul, to return to that bowl of light that we are, is our key. But how? How do we get there? Well, there's a scriptural story that points the way there's a man who has a son who, in the description in the Bible, it sounds like what we would call epilepsy today. He has seizures, he foams at the mouth, he rolls about, sometimes he rolls near the fire. And he can't uh, speak while he's in this state. 
and so it's presumed maybe he can't hear too. And so a man comes to get some healing, and he comes to the disciples, and Jesus is busy up on the mountaintop being transfigured at that moment. And so <laughs> he had something to do that day. <laughs> and so the other disciples, you know, who have been taught to do the healing work and are very successful at it, are brought this young boy. And so they try to heal him, but nothing's working. And so Jesus comes down, and he has taken with him Peter, James, and John, who metaphysically represent faith, love, and wisdom. Always a good idea to take faith, love, and wisdom with you wherever you go, especially when you've got something big on your agenda for the day. And so Jesus and the, and the three come back, and the man, and, and, and there's lots of commotion, and, and he says, well, you know, what's going on? And the man tells his story, you know, about the son, and, you know, your disciples try to heal him, and, and, he, and he wasn't able to be healed. And, and he says, you know, I, I, could you try if, if you're able? And Jesus says, if I'm able, you know, <laughs> he's just come down from the mountaintop with like the radiating, you know, truth of spirit. And so he's in that place, of, I know who I am. <laughs> and so the man, he says to the man, you know, you must believe. And the man says, and I just, this, this, this moment, I can almost feel like I'm there whenever I read this or hear this again. It just gets me at the cellular level. The man cries out, I believe, help me with my unbelief. And it's like, I get it, I've got the faith. I know I came in with that, I understand that. What I don't get is how to get rid of the doubts, <laughs> how to get rid of the stuff that's in the way. Help me with that. And so Jesus does. He sees, it says in the scriptures next, always interesting some of these lines, that a crowd came running forth. So he looks up and he sees a crowd coming running together. And that's when he does the healing and he casts out the unclean spirit. And he says, and, and the words are strong, so I want to um, quote it. He says, you spirit, that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you out of him, and never again to enter him. And of course, then the boy is healed, and he helps him up, and everybody is, of course, astounded because their unbeliefs have been laid down. And what is there can arise. The light and the truth and the knowing and the faith and the strength is there for them to see. And so then the disciples in private say to him, how come we couldn't do it? How come we couldn't do that healing? I mean, because they're performing lots of healings. They're trying to understand, what is it that I missed in the teachings that I wasn't able to do this one? None of us were. And Jesus says something very interesting that points the way to where we're headed here. He says, this kind can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. It's like, there's a level, there's an understanding that there is a greater depth to the journey. And that journey, when we get to that point, is about unlearning. It's about letting go. It's about shedding and stripping away what has been collected along the way that is blocking the light. And so that is the invitation, and we're right on target with Lenten season. This Lenten season, which is, I think, something that was, um, I, it, it came through the Orthodox Church as a practice, but it's a wonderful practice. In the Lenten season, the practice is about fasting and prayer, about the practices of fasting and prayer. And traditionally, that's fasting from food, which certainly you can do and will enhance your experience if you compare it with consciousness. If you just fast from food, you might lose weight and be on a diet and, you know, it may have some physical benefits for you. But if you don't have consciousness about it, then it's not, it doesn't have the spiritual component of the fast. But the consciousness then, if, if you do choose to do a fast from food, the consciousness then with it will tell you what's going on. You know, sometimes you might, a lot of times what happens is that, for me anyway, is the surface level stuff gets, gets, you know, comes up for me to see. You know, so the stuff just below the surface comes to the surface is what I mean. And so, you know, if I'm mildly irritated lately, I will be mildly irritated throughout the time I'm fasting. Or if I, you know, if my energy has been like, bing, 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 
you know, <laughs> it'll be kind of like that, you know? So whatever it is that's happening for you, you know, sometimes it's just, whew, calm and clear, you know? But you don't have to fast from food to practice fasting. It's just letting go of what's in the way, right? So fasting from negativity is really what it's about. That's the spiritual aspect of it. It's a letting go of the unbelief. It's a letting go of the doubts. It's a letting go of all the stones that are in the bowl, taking them out one by one, the resentments, the complaints, the criticisms, the defensiveness, whatever it is that stands in the way between you and your God and you in meeting God everywhere you go. So it is the stripping away that is the experience that we're on. Fasting, then, about untruths, or as Charles Fillmore would call it, error thinking. And, and not focusing on what isn't working anymore. So when we begin to subtract the not me and the not true, that's when we kind of turn the corner on the spiritual journey. You know, so it may be at the beginning of our journey we learn about abundance and it's about sort of the goodies and the add-ons and the you know, the, the, what I'm creating. And that's still part of our journey, very much a part of our journey. It's, it's our teachings about co-creating and, and bringing forth, you know, becoming, setting our eyes on what it is that we want to become and becoming that. But when we get a little further in the journey, we start to, to learn what all the mystics have always known, is that actually it's not about adding anymore. It's about subtracting. <laughs> Meister Eckert, the great mystic, said soul growth is a process not of addition but of subtraction. It is the stripping away. And a lot of people don't know that in our roots of following the teachings of Jesus, which some would call Christianity, it, it, that the roots of that have, is our, our, there's a plethora of mystics in our roots. You know, Meister Eckert being one of them, who was in the Dominican order, but the desert mothers and fathers, the very early folks that would go out into the desert to those barren places so that they too could get open to the truth of who they, were, they are, to remove that which might stand in the way, to become like the desert, fully open, exposed, and willing, and then to receive the glory <laughs> that comes with a recognition of who we really are. So we have that in the traditions, the mystics of all traditions, kind of meeting in this place of understanding that it isn't so much about adding knowledge or wisdom or it's already there. <laughs> That's how we came in. We came in in oneness. We came in in light. We came in in love. We understood this innately when we came in to the world as an infant. And we had to learn the word of, world of two-ness. We had to learn the world of duality because we are now in the world of form. That was the great challenge that we were created for so that God could know itself. How will I know myself if I'm just one? If I'm just, you know, a fish swimming in the ocean that has no idea I'm in water? How will I know till I get out of the water? <laughs> you get on land and experience that. And so here we are. <laughs> here we are. And we come to a place where we say, huh, what if the race is over? <laughs> what if I don't have to add one more thing? What if I'm perfect and whole just as I am? Then what is in my way? Ah, that belief that says I'm not good enough. Or that thing that, that I internalize that isn't true. And I realize now and I forgive and let go because the adults in my life tr treated me and taught me as best they could. It's not theirs, it's mine. <laughs> and so I remove it. The children learn to remove the stones themselves. Nobody says in that story that teaches the young children in Hawaii, I will come, mommy and daddy will come and remove the stones. Even if mommy and daddy contributed the stones, they're yours. <laughs> and so it is our spiritual work to let go. To let go, let go, let go, let go, strip away and then go, wow. Thank you, God, for the truth and the light and the love that I am. And that never is an egoic kind of realization. It is the humblest of realizations when we get to that place and we recognize the truth of who we are. Yeah. 
Are you with me? So in the fasting, what are we fasting from? These limited thoughts. We're going to quit complaining. That's what we're going to quit doing. <laughs> there was a man who was very unhappy with his life. It's one of those things where wherever you go, there you are, you know? And so he was a complainer, right? Who loves a complainer, right? We all flock to complainers, right? <laughs> And so this man decided, I'm going to go into the monastery, and maybe I can, you know, find happiness there. I'll figure out what this is that makes me so unhappy. And so he decides, I'm going to take a vow of silence. And the other monks agree with him that after his first year that he can speak, at, or on the anniversary if he stays more years, every time he stays for a full year, he can speak two words to break the silence. And then he starts over again. He agrees. He thinks it's a great idea. So on the anniversary, the first year, he says, cold floor. <laughs> A whole nother year passes, hard bed. Yet another year, bad food. <laughs> on the fourth year, I quit. <laughs> and the other, the head monk, said, or the head abbot says, well, great, because all you've done since you've been here is complain. <laughs> we are funny little beings, aren't we? <laughs> it's an unconscious habit, you know? It can be unconscious until it's conscious, and that's when, they, when things move. But until we're conscious of the ways that we complain, we can't really move on until we become conscious of what we're doing and how it's affecting us. I think that's probably the key. It's not just what we're doing, because we'll just keep doing what we're doing until we realize how it limits us, how it keeps us small, how it doesn't allow us to know the truth and the glory of who we are and, and, and who we've come to be and, and what our real mission is on this planet. You know, really, in, in simple form, it really is just to have God know itself. And so if you get clearer and clearer on that, then you give that great gift back to spirit for it to know itself as you and through you. In Chinese, the word for complaint comes from two symbols. It, it is the hug and the ego. And so when you put it together, it means hugging your ego. To complain is hugging your ego. And you can see now how if you're hugging your ego, you know, you're blocking. <laughs> There's some kind of block of the divine. We just get so um, filled up, and especially in our culture in the West, we are so much, of, we love information and knowledge, don't we? We love to, to work the brain and to uh, expand our knowledge base. And that, that is a fun part of life. And yet, it can get to be too much. It can be so much that, you know, our heads are too big for our bodies after a while, you know? <laughs> There's an old story about a, a professor from the West who goes to the East to meet with a Zen master. And the professor is thrilled that he has this ability, this opportunity to meet with a Zen master. And so he comes in and, and he's seated, and then the, the Zen master comes in and he says, would you like a cup of tea? The professor doesn't really like tea, but he thinks, well, it's probably the right thing to do to say yes. You know, he doesn't want to offend the, the master. He wants to gain some wisdom from him. He wants some pearls to take back home. And so he's hoping he won't pour him very much. But the master begins to pour tea, and, and he fills the cup, and he keeps filling and filling. And the professor's getting very nervous, you know, and he's kind of holding up his hands. And the Zen master just keeps pouring. He's thinking, is something wrong? Is he not seeing? What's going on? You know, he's trying to make sense of it. And it starts overflowing in the cup into the saucer. And then the professor, you know, starts, you know, starting to stand up a bit, you know, and it pours over the saucer and onto the table. And then it begins to drip on the floor. And the professor finally stands up and he says, stop. And the Zen master says, oh, yes. He says, you see, a mind that is already full can receive no wisdom. <laughs> and so it is the emptying, the letting go, the, the no thing, the, I, the returning again and again to, I know that I don't know. 
or I don't know that I don't know. <laughs> you know, the real openness, that kind of place. Sometimes we complain because we have another need, right? Sometimes we complain because we're trying to make some kind of connection or, you know, as Brene Brown talked about in our last series, we're trying to hotwire connection, she says. And we do that in ways where we might, you know, gossip with somebody. We might, hey, did you know about so-and-so? Because it maybe will create some kind of, oh, so so-and-so, you're in the know, you know? So we think somehow that's going to get us in or make a connection somehow, or it's going to gain us some kind of approval. Or we might do that in other ways, you know, where we, what she talks about common enemy intimacy, where we get together in groups and, and, and so together we are, you know, we've got the, the idea or we're, we're right and, and what about them, you know, and so, so now we're banded together. But she says it's not real intimacy, this idea of common enemy intimacy or trying to hotwire these connections. That's not the real thing, right? And so that's, that, that kind of thing is complaining, that kind of gossiping. Or, but to know then why we're doing it sometimes is helpful, to know that there is some other need, and then we can you know, see how we can meet that need instead of complaining and adding negativity into the world and into our bowl of light. So Maya Angelou also weighed in on this. <laughs> she says that if you don't like something, change it. And if you can't change it, change your attitude. <laughs> Don't complain, she said. Complaining, she said, lets the bullies know that a victim is in the neighborhood. I never thought about it that way. I really like it. Because you know what happens when everybody finds out that there's a victim in the neighborhood, at least the bullies find out, you know, they kind of band together, right? And then they go and, 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 you know, harass that individual who appears weaker. And so she's saying complaining makes you appear weak, right? Like you can't fix it yourself. You can't, not fix it, but you can't take responsibility, right? The ability to respond. The ability to respond to the situation. So it communicates to people that you're not able to kind of take care of yourself. You're not coming from that place of strength and light, in other words. And so when bullies come together like that, that gang, that crowd, metaphysically, it's kind of like the crowd of thoughts, right? And so that's, I think, what that line was at the beginning of the story when Jesus was about to heal the boy. And it was almost like, like he, when this line comes and he says, the crowd began to run together. And then it's like he hurried up quick, cast the spirit out. It's like he, he, the crowd in, in um, metaphysics of, of the Bible, people are thoughts and feelings. And so the crowd is the crowd of thoughts and feelings, right? It's that energy of I start complaining or I start gossiping and it begins to, you know, there's a crescendo effect, right? Or there's other people that are coming in. There's sort of that ganging up kind of effect that happens inside the mind. And so those thoughts and feelings that say you're not good enough start to look for evidence that you're not good enough. And you'll find it if you're looking that hard, right? Not that it's truth, but you'll find it, and so you can add to it. You know, or somebody says, well, I'm not very smart. And so you find all kinds of evidence in the world about, to prove to you that you're not very smart. You know? So Jesus feels it coming. He sees it coming. He sees it in the crowd around him. And the people and the thoughts, when the man cries out, help my unbelief, he realizes, oh, here comes a crowd of unbelief. I better cast this out now. And that's the same kind of urgency with which we have when we have those moments of awakening. When we turn the corner on our spiritual journey from addition into subtraction, when we go back to our mystical roots, we come to that place, that turning point, that, that place where we begin to recognize and realize, oh, it's now, I got to cast it out. I got to help my unbelief. I got to let go the doubt, the resentment, the burden, the complaint, the gossip, whatever it is, the sarcasm. Cast it out so I can be the truth of who I am, the bowl of light from which I came into this world. So Lent is a powerful time. If we really practice it, we begin, if we haven't yet, to turn that corner, to recognize, 
the power of subtraction, of letting go, of surrendering, of giving over, of laying at the feet of spirit, so to speak, which is just within us, right? Just within reach. March, or, um, Groucho Marx, I almost, I almost reversed his name. That was interesting. <laughs> Groucho Marx said, now there's a man with an open mind. I can feel the breeze from here. <laughs> sort of true, though, isn't it? When you come in the presence of somebody who's really open, who's really, you know, in that place of openness and open-mindedness and willing just to, to be the very presence, there's like a fresh breeze. It's like, oh, how refreshing to be in the, that presence. I remember once getting to meet Eckhart Tolle at Unity uh, Village. And, you know, at that time it was like, ooh, well, I still kind of feel that, like, wow, Eckhart Tolle, you know? So I was sitting in the front row, and he comes in that I didn't know, but he was coming to the stage. But all of a sudden, I feel this like whoo, swoosh of energy. And I turn around, and he's walking by. It was that kind of breeze. And I was so amazed, because it happened again later. I was at a reception. And again, I was, my back was turned. And all, suddenly, I felt that, that, that breeze, that energy, that presence. And I turned around, and there he was again. You know, and for each of us, it might come to us in different ways for different people. But it, and for ourselves, then, we can be the fresh breeze. That, that's the point here, right? <laughs> We can be the open mind. We can be the open heart. We can be the open soul. In fact, it is who we have come to be. Nothing has to be added, only subtracted for us to know that truth. So getting to what we're about here today is prayer and fasting. How do we do it? In unity, prayer, affirmative prayer, includes an important piece not to leave out. You know, so if a prayer chaplain is praying with you and, and they realize you're in a lot of fear or a lot of worry and you're praying for a new job, they're going to first help you release and address the fear. Because if you don't address that, the good can't come forward, right? And so statements like, this fear has no power over you. Any worry that you're feeling right now is now dissolved in the light of God's love. For we know in truth that you go forth to meet the right and perfect position that will fulfill you and prosper you in every way. That's the affirmation. But you see how important the release is? It's so important to meet the thing that stands in our way and to remove that boulder so that the light can come forth. So affirmative prayer, statements of release, can be very helpful to us in this work. And it's a nice companion with the fasting from negativity and complaining. So when you came in, you may have received a bracelet. If you didn't receive a bracelet, would you raise your hand? So this is a tool for our 21 days to become complaint-free. Will Bowen was in ministerial school with me. He was a year behind me. And um, he was really touched by Edwin Gaines' and work on prosperity when she talks about um, not complaining. So much so that it's become his whole life's work. And he began a movement called creating, or called a complaint-free world. And his vision was that 10 million people would have these bracelets, and, and not that it has to be these bracelets, any bracelet, but they would take on this practice, this 21-day practice of becoming complaint-free. And his goal at, at 6 million, he, uh, gave one, he presented one to Maya Angelou, and that, of course, increased. And then at one point, he was at Oprah, and of course, that increased them. So they have hit and, and gone beyond their 10 million goal. So this is the kind of, you know, new thought infusion in the world, right? Going complaint-free. So this is how it works. So you put the bracelet on one wrist, and remember where you start. If you, if you want a reminder, left, right, left, right, left, or you can start with left. <laughs> And so when you catch yourself complaining, which is criticizing, being sarcastic, um, complaining in general, whining, <laughs> you move the bracelet to the other wrist. The other piece that's important is to keep track of what day you're on. So if you moved it 
and you got to start over. Then you're on day one again, okay? And then you complain again, you got to start over. But if you don't complain that day, you get to leave it on the wrist, so you need to know that you're on day two. So record it somewhere so that you'll remember what day you're on. The goal is to get to 21 days. This is a lot harder than you think it might be. <laughs> yes. The average person complains 15 to 30 times a day. So there may be a lot of this, even in a day. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so the, and, and, and we're, I know that Reverend David, when he did this before, I was told by some people, if you're still around and you had that experience, that he had you uh, do it when you, even a thought, that is way too advanced for me. <laughs> so, um, so we're just starting with a spoken complaint, okay? If it comes out of your mouth, then you have to start over. <laughs> If you get through 21 days like that, then you can challenge yourself to do the thinking part. But for now, we're just going to go with the spoken. And so, um, so the other thing to remember is not to police one another. For all of you who live with one another, for those of us who work together, <laughs> we're not going to be bracelet cops. So if you do point out to somebody, then you have to change it. And don't be clever. That's, he, I, I left that one off in the first service, and someone came up to me with a clever idea. And I said, OK, I better put it in the second service. He said, well, I'm just going to wear a bracelet on both wrists. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> don't be, yeah, it's always day one. There you go. That's one way to interpret that. And the funny thing is, another person at the 9 o'clock service told me that um, when the bracelets were being passed out, he's like, oh, rubber bracelets? I hate rubber bracelets. <laughs> Try not to complain right out of the box. <laughs> so this is our work. Fasting and prayer. Fasting from complaining. See if you can go 21 days. It's 28 days between now and Easter. So I'm not saying we won't go beyond Easter, because you know, when Will Bowen did this, it took him six months the first time. So you know, it's a practice, but it's, it's a practice of removing stones so that we can be the bowl of light that we came to be. It's the practice of spiritual subtraction so that we can be the truth and the light and shine that into the world. So let's affirm that together as we close out today. Together? I am a complaint-free bowl of light. And that's the truth of who you are. Bless you.